Um, what I want to talk to you about today is an idea that we pretty much take for granted, but I think uh, have, in the process of taking it for granted, have pretty much diminished. And that's the idea of literacy, and what literacy is, and, and what literacy might mean to us as we go forward into a world where education, even in this state, is already in the, in the midst of pretty remarkable changes. Uh, most of you just got out of high school in time to avoid the Michigan Merit Curriculum, four years of math, four years of English. Now, if you're just a freshman coming in next year, two years of foreign language, minimum requirements for getting out of high school, three years of science, three years of social science. Um, undoubtedly, one of the major educational reforms in a, in a country that has had a history of major educational reforms for the last you know, couple hundred years almost. So as we look forward, what, what does literacy mean? And I want to try to inform that notion by talking about the works of Paulo Ferrer, who if you're an English 111 student, you've probably already been introduced to. He's sort of one of the foundational texts that we spin our English 110, uh, 111 class around. Um, the idea of, um, of, of what his ideas of literacy, his opposition to what he calls the banking concept of education is, and what that means to schools. So that's sort of where I'm going to try to go with this. What I want to start with is by talking about how we think about literacy today. You know, um, George W. Bush has a real famous quote that people don't like him very much. I always put out there on the inter internet that said, if you teach a child to read, they'll be able to pass a literacy test. And we're in the middle of, through, uh, you know, how, I don't know how you feel about it, but I, I consider a fairly misguided approach to education called No Child Left Behind. Um, with massive testing every year for you to find out what your, what your reading level is, what your writing level is, what your math level is, science level is, and those kinds of things. Um, and that that's the way that we promote literacy. That literacy is something you do really for somebody else. It's something that you do to prove that you have a right to get in the door. And if you don't do well on the test, then we, t we tell you, we pat you on the head and say, I'm sorry, uh, you have to go live in a trailer somewhere. We got nothing else for you to do. You know, you don't get to go, you don't get to go anywhere, you get to go to mid. You know, but you, you don't get to go to Harvard, you don't get to go to state, you don't get to go to U of M, you don't even get to go to Central. Okay? And if you look at literacy that way, uh, you need to understand a little bit about where that idea of literacy comes from. It comes from an idea of public education that was geared to move people from the farm to the factory. Uh, theorists who look at this stuff talk, use the word Fordist, as in Henry Ford. That when Henry Ford made the assembly line and hired Alfred Taylor, an uh, industrial psychologist who m did time, man time movement studies to show how many times a day you could pick up a quarter panel of Model T, move it over here, and set it on the, on the line without going crazy or hurting yourself. You know, that school systems grew up around this Fordist idea. Think for a minute about what a school day is like. You know, I mean, we start training you at the age of five, if not earlier, uh, to be a compliant individual, to sit in your seat, to keep your mouth shut, to do the worksheet, to do the things that you're supposed to do, and then the bell will ring and you get up and you move robot-like someplace else and sit down and do the exact same thing all over again. Um, by the time you get to be a senior in high school, you're so used to taking tests that when we take three days out of doing anything that's important in school and make you take the MEEP or make you take the ACT, you say, yeah, sure, I, I take tests. That's okay. I know how to do it. I brought my pencils. You know, I'm not, I'm not very happy, but I had breakfast. I'm, I'm ready to go. Jean Piaget, who many of the ideas of the modern school movement are based on, has a wonderful quote. He says that you can tell how bad our school system is because we take kids who want nothing, who are five years old and want nothing more in the world than to go to school. You know, and if you've ever seen a kindergartner on their way to school or a first grader with their lunchbox running to the bus on their way to school, it's a pretty amazing thing. I want to be a big kid. I want to go to school. You know, you go to any L, early L classroom, first or second grade, teacher says, 
ask a question. You got people punching each other in the mouth to get their hand up first so that the teacher will call on them. The teacher calls on them and says, yes, Tommy, and Tommy says, I don't know. Um, but next time they got their hand in the air, you go to a classroom full of seniors at any high school in the area, and what do you see? Teacher says, okay, what do you think about this? And 30 board people look back at them and say, you know, I've been playing that game for a long time. I ain't playing that game no more, man. You answer your own damn question. PJ said, we, we take five-year-olds who want nothing more in the world to go to school, and we turn them into 18-year-olds who want nothing more in the world than to get out of school, who resist school. And most of you are professional resistors. You've been resisting school for a long time. You know, you do what you have to do if you have to, but, you know, this guy, you're going to have to step on me a little bit even to make it so I have to do it. And the initial idea that learning is something that we love, that learning is something that we naturally do, people naturally want to learn. You know, people, people and you do learn all the time in other aspects of your life. You know, you, you want to fix your car, you learn about it. You know, you can't get enough of it. You want to learn how to ski? You want to learn how to hunt? You want to learn how to, you know, do any of those kind of things? You just soak up knowledge and information. Put you in a school classroom, <laughs> shades come down, that's it. That kind of literacy is what I call compliant literacy. It's, it's the literacy of schools. It's the literacy that says, we're going to test you until we can't test you no more. And if you pass enough tests, we will let you through these few screening holes to go to college, to get jobs. We'll sort you out. We'll let you know what your future is going to be. And you'll just accept it. And that's what school's for. As my friend Evan Watkins says, school for most people is still pretty much a place where you learn, where you go to learn your place. You know, you go to school because then people tell you, okay, you belong in this group, you belong in that group, you belong in this other group. Okay, now, a compliant form of literacy works if the culture is stable and the future is predictable. I mean, it's, it's not healthy. It's not, I'm not defending it as being good, but it works if there's enough jobs down the road so that no matter which one of these screening holes you get put into, it's going to be okay. When I was in high school long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, I grew up just outside of Flint, um, the people who didn't like school, who were really good resistors at school, graduated from high school, drove 20 minutes down the road, signed up at GM, and are now just retiring, made a hell of a lot more money than I ever made, um, and we're just fine with it. Didn't matter. Those plants don't exist anymore. You know, when I go visit my parents and I drive down through 475 through Flint, when you get about a third of the way down 475 into the heart of Flint, there's a big open field. I mean, that's miles long. That used to be what they call Buick City. That used to be the largest outside of River Rouge, the largest connected automobile facility in the world. And there's nothing there, just weeds. Compliant literacy works as long as the jobs are there, the economics are there, the political system is there to support it. But we don't live in that kind of time. We don't live in a time where you can take what your parents knew, take it to the bank, cash it in, live your own life, pass it on to your children, and that's it. If I could give you a pill, and by taking that pill, you could know everything that your parents knew, everything. You don't want to know everything your parents know. But if you could know everything your parents know, would it be enough? Could you just take that and say, OK, that's all I need? I don't think anybody here believes that. I'm not denigrating what your parents know. I mean, they know some important stuff. But they don't know enough. We live in a world where, for one of the first times in history, being old is not really an advantage. I mean, being old, I've got to tell you, is never really an advantage. But uh, you know, it used to be a cultural advantage because you had more experience. You know, people, people 
uh, valued age because if something came up that nobody had ever seen before, you'd go find the oldest, smartest person you could find and say, have you ever seen this before? You know, what happens when uh, we don't get rain in August? What happens when, and the old folks could answer it for you. Oh, well, the last time this came up, this is what happened. But we live in a world where grandparents bribe their grandchildren to program their cell phones. Right? We live in a world where both technology and the changes in the economy are, are driving us into a world that is less and less predictable, less and less known. The people who claim to know these things, and I always put that caveat in that they claim to know these things, say that 60% of the jobs that are out there in the job market 15 years from now don't even exist right now. Not there aren't enough of them or we don't, they don't exist. You know, I mean, if you go on the web and look up green jobs, for instance, what you'll see is that there's this whole exploding area of the economy where people are working on technologies and working in, in areas that five years ago never even existed. Nobody, nobody was even talking about them. You know, the energy debate that's going to become more and more pivotal to both our economy and our culture and our security, uh, that's just really a beginning debate. Now, there have been people that have been involved in it for a long time, but it's always been on the fringe. It's going to be something that you're going to have to know something about. There are going to be jobs in that area, and there's going to be education in that area. And my point is, is that a compliant literacy is okay if the world that you're living in is fairly stable, maybe even static. But a compliant literacy runs into real problems when you take what you learn in school, even if you resisted it and didn't want to learn it very much, and you take it over here and you plug it into your slot and you say, okay, I think I'm one of these. Okay, sign me up, wake me up in 50 years, give me my gold watch, send me home. I, I promise to show up most days. You know, resistance is part of the workplace though too. I mean. Uh, when I was 17, I worked in uh, a, a GM plant. Matter of fact, Fisher won. I, every day I walked by the, the monument to the sit-down strikers who formed the UAW in 1937. And I was a replacement worker back in the days when they could afford to have placement workers, um, which meant that I rotated around jobs. And the guy that I worked with most of the time was named Woodrow. And Woodrow, the first thing that he taught me, he taught me two things the first day I worked there. We were welding quarter panels together on Buick Wildcats, which gives you some idea of how old I am. But the uh, first thing he taught me was how to take a metal bar and stick it in this conveyor belt, and we could all go to lunch. Because it was going to take him a couple hours to get the line back up and running again. And nobody ever knew who grabbed the bar. Can't tell you, man. I didn't see it. All that, that turned around this thing, I knew there was the bar. What do you want me to do? The second thing he taught me was every now and then when we'd weld a quarter panel together, he'd pick up a handful of washers, throw them in between the two pieces of the quarter panel, weld them together, and look at me and say, they'll never find that rattle. <laughs> they can take this baby back to the dealer from now until the sun, you know. And they ain't never figuring out what's wrong with this one. You know, never give in to the man. Always fight back. Always be resistant. And that's what compliant literacy does to schools. It makes you like Woodrow. It makes all of us like Woodrow. When, when, and when I get in a minute to talking about Ferrer and his ideas about the banking concept, one of the things you have to understand is that most of the time when I hear students talk about the banking concepts, it's what teachers do to you. It's not what teachers do to you. It's what the society does to schools. And teachers are caught in the trap of what schools are every bit as much as you are. You know, they, they, are, they are a victim of this oppression and also a means, an agency of oppression every bit as much as the students are. Um, we don't live in that world anymore. We don't live in a world where compliant literacy will get you from one place to the next. If you only know what your parents know, if you only know, in fact, what we're going to teach you, you don't know nearly enough. You're ill-prepared for what's going to happen next. As Chuck Bowden, who teaches sociology here, says, educating someone today is like preparing somebody to go participate in the Olympics, but we don't know what event you're going to be in. 
Do you have to be fast? Do you have to be strong? Do you have to be a member of a team? Do you have to be an individual? You know, do you, should you jump? Should you? So what you have to do is prepare you to be everything. You know, you live in a moment where the idea of education and literacy is undergoing change, not because people looked around and said, well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of bored. Let's, let's go out and do something different today. Let's, let's scramble things around a little bit. And see where You live in a moment where education and literacy are changing because the needs of education and literacy are changing, which means, as it always has historically, that schools themselves are going to change shape. They're going to change mission. Now, they'll do it slowly. They'll do it painfully. They'll do it clumsily. And maybe they won't even get to where they need to go, but they're already in the process of changing. You know, if you don't believe that, if you have a younger brother or sister who's a, a sophomore in high school, talk to them about what they have to do to get out. Watch two years from now when, if the numbers are right, somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of the parents who have children that are not going to pass Algebra 2 by the time they're ready to graduate from high school show up at a, a school board meeting and say, what do you mean my kid's not going to graduate from high school? You know, uh, they're, they're going to change and that change is going to be painful. But I want to introduce the ideas of what education and what literacy are supposed to be that Paulo Ferrer developed. And, and I think that those will help us see what the future of literacy is going to be all about. Now, there are some things that Ferrer never really talked about because, you know, he died several years ago. He wasn't around to see them. He wasn't really a part of the technological revolution, which is part of the, the, the information literacy of the future that you're going to need to have, that schools aren't doing a very good job of, of, of training you about. But his, whole, his basic approach to literacy is one that I think we need to take now. And what I want to, you know, what I want to do is to talk about what Ferrer thought literacy was. And Ferrer was a, had a version of radical literacy, not compliant literacy. And radical literacy is a very, very different thing than the kind of literacy that you get when you're in the Bluebird reading group and Joe's in the Cardinal reading group and I'm over here in the Eagle reading group laughing at both of you. You know, I mean, it, it's not that kind of literacy anymore. Ferrer was a literacy educator in Brazil they sent him out, <clears throat> part of the UNESCO program in the 50s and 60s, to raise the level of literacy around the world because rising literacy improves the economy, which is not true, but it, it's, a, it's a typical sort of thing that you hear. Um, Brian Street and, and uh, Harry Graff have done extensive research that have shown that it, it, literacy doesn't necessarily improve your economic lot. It might, but it, it, there's not a direct correlation between it. So they sent Ferrer out into the mining camps and villages to teach people how to read. And he went out with the same old reading material that everybody goes out with. You know, he went out with, with books that said, here's a cat, see the cat, see the dog. You know, we've all been there at one point or another in our lives. And people blew him off, nothing happened. His success rate is what the success rate in adult literacy educators is pretty much everywhere in the world, which is that 80% of the people who voluntarily come to adult literacy programs, 80% of them leave within the first 10 hours of instruction because they're tired of being treated like children. You know, the, the, the most telling little story about that is that you get all the time in adult literacy centers is that you know somebody rides the bus to get to the literacy center and the first thing that they do in the adult literacy program is try to teach them how to read the bus schedule. Well, you know, how in the hell do you think I got here? You know, teach me something I don't know. Treat me like an adult. Treat me like somebody, you know, that, that is deserving of a little bit of respect, which almost never happens in those situations. Okay. So Ferrer threw his books away, and he said, okay, dialogically, which is a big word for Ferrer, he said, if you want to learn how to read, what's important for you? What are, what are the important words for you? Not cat and dog. You know what cat and dog are. What are the important words for you? And the words that the people that he was teaching came up with are words like vote, ballot, 
union contract wages. And Ferrer started an educational program that took those adults where they were and taught them the literacy that would do one important thing that education today is not doing, and that is they taught them a literacy that would engage in and change the world that they lived in. What Ferrer says, and, and, and he was phenomenally successful, so su successful that the military junta that ran Brazil put a contract out to have him killed, not once, not twice, but three times. So he ended up in America for uh, a big chunk of his, you know, in the 70s, a big chunk of his adult life because it wasn't safe for him to live in Brazil. Because real literacy is never safe. Real literacy is not about being compliant. Real literacy is always about engaging in your world to change it. If you're learning something that's valuable, it's valuable because it helps you make the world that you live in. It helps you determine the terms. It helps you drive the discussion that's going to make the world that you're being educated to be in what you want it to be, not what somebody else told you it should be. If at the end of your literacy, somebody gives you a job, you know, uh, and as a result of that job, as Bob Dylan once said, 20 years of school and then they put you on the day shift. Then that's not literacy. And it, it's hard to argue that sometimes for people when the gravy train is there. You never would have been able to convince any of the guys I went to high school with who ended up working at GM that their literacy wasn't okay. Because their life was okay. They made money. They were all right. But if you bring these two things together, if you bring together the idea that you're living at a time where there are no guarantees, the people who do demographics, if you're under 30 and you're sitting here today, you're the first generation of Americans that's going to have a lower standard of living than your parents. I say that every time I give this speech, but I've never said it on the heels of what's happened in Wall Street in the last 10 days. You know, that, that literally, what people project for you is that your standard of living is never going to be as high as your parents' is. That's what compliant literacy will get you. We're living at a time where Ferrer's idea of radical literacy, of you changing the world, and the political and economic realities that exist come together in a way that they have never come together in this country in my lifetime. One of the reasons that Ferrer's work doesn't translate well to America, as some people say, is because America was always stable. And Ferrer's idea of literacy was that literacy is radical. It's about social change. The reason you become literate is not to have a job. The reason you become literate is to be in charge of your own life, to be in charge of the political and economic circumstances, the social circumstances, the relationship circumstances, that make you a fulfilled human being. Um, Ferrer has a term called constantization. And in constantization, what that means is that you're able to sort of hold your own time and thought. You're able to see what's going on around you and react to what's going on around you as an agent and not a victim, as an actor and not a pawn. And that's why people in Ferrer's world become literate. They become literate so that they, they can control their own lives. Schools, the schools that you and I have grown up in, okay, are not about making you an actor or an agent. Unless you're one of those lucky few that get tapped on the shoulder and said, uh, we like you, you come over here. The rest of you just sit in your seat and do the, do the uh, grammar worksheet. We'll get back to you. It's very nice. Color in the lines. You know, don't, don't, uh, don't get your milk, don't spill the milk on the desk, don't crumble the cookies, take the nap when you're told to. We'll get back to you. What, what, what literacy is for Ferrer is a whole idea of education. For us, literacy is a subset of education. It's something you do while you're at school. For Ferrer, literacy is the reason that education exists. The reason that education exists is to engage you in the things that you need to know to change your world, to be in your world, and to make decisions for yourself in your world. 
Now, he has one very optimistic viewpoint that underpins all this, and it's the same optimistic viewpoint that Jack Mesereau has for those of you who are in 111 and have to, you know, have to read about transformative education. And that one optimistic underpinning is, is that you want to be educated. You want to know. You, 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 we have a, a desire, a natural desire to learn. We have a natural desire to be, to, to, to be able to direct our own fate. Now, there are a lot of other people who don't believe that that's true. I think it's important to put that out there on the table so that you understand what both Mesereau and Ferrer think about uh, you. Think about what's, what, it is that student, what, what it is that fundamentally drives students to do what they do while they're in school. So if literacy, in a Ferrerian sense, is going to take place, the future of literacy is not in school. The future of literacy is about changing school to meet the world that you're going to be in, not allowing school to predetermine the world that you're going to be in. And there are some factors that are emerging, that have been emerging and are continue to emerge even ever more quickly, uh, that have something to do with that. We, when you come to school, we treat literacy as a paper, paper pencil, book kind of thing, right? Now, you take the 111 class, Somebody shows you an academic database. Terribly exciting. You go down the lot, library, Sean or some of the people there show you that there are these other places to look up academic article, articles, which I know is just like, like the most exciting rush that you've had all semester. The idea that you could find academic articles that you could look up and spend your time reading. But we don't really engage what's happening with you. How many of you have a, a MySpace or Facebook account? How many of you have a cell phone? How many of you text? Are, we, are you learning about that in school? I know you text in school. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's one of the, that's one of the newfound things in, in, in teaching in America, is when you're looking out there and you're talking to the people in your class and you're looking at them and they're all going like this. Right? And you know, you talk to teachers, they're going, oh my God, look at these people, they're in the room, they're texting, and, I'm, and I'm, here I am, I'm saying the most important things that they're ever going to hear in their life, and they're not paying attention to me. And the test, the test, the test is Tuesday. They, they have to listen. Radical disconnection. Not radical engagement. You know? We haven't even started to do what European, uh, European countries in Canada do, and that's teach you about television and mass media. You can't graduate from can high school in Canada without taking a class in television and mass media so that you understand how that media works, so that you understand visual, the visual literacies that are being communicated. Uh, John McCain and Barack Obama had a debate last night, okay? Most of the people determined, the people who didn't, you know, like already have a horse in this race, most of the quote unquote independent or undecided voters who decide that one or the other of those people won the debate do not decide that on the basis of what they say. They decided on the basis of how they look. You know, the, whose personality do you like? Whose style, whose language do you like? Whose mannerisms do you relate to? You know, now one of them says, and I plan on killing all the people in Michigan. I mean, you might sit up and take notice. But, you know, that, that's a visual literacy. We don't teach that in school. You know, and, and as a matter of fact, all the learning that you've done about visual literacies, you've done on your own. So when you take a tape or a DVD and put it into a machine and show it in the front of the classroom, what do students do? That's just what I do at home, man. I'm, you know, that's a signal. I'm like Pavlov's dog. You turn on a screen, I'm going to bed. You know? 
Look at, the, look at the way that emerging literacies, that emerging technologies are changing the way that we communicate. And they're changing the way that we understand what's going on in the world. In 1990, when, in 91, when the Iron Curtain fell, when the Berlin Wall came down. Now, if, you, if you're my age, when, if people would have told you they're bringing down the Berlin Wall today, you were headed for your fallout shelter. Because the only way that we were taught that the Iron Curtain was going to fall and that communism was going to lose, well, that's another debate for another day at another time, um, was through war. Instead, and this is, you know, 1990, a lot of you weren't even born, some, at least some of you probably weren't even born yet. Um, what changed were fax machines. The, uh, the ability for people to communicate back. And the Iron Wall fell because it became, your physical barriers didn't matter anymore. Just like geography doesn't matter for you anymore. Many of the people that I quote unquote work with around the country, I hardly ever see them. As a matter of fact, there's one guy that I've never met. But we exchange emails, we exchange files, we work on projects together all the time even though we don't live anywhere near each other. That's not uncommon. My son is a computer engineer who graduated from the University of Michigan. He lives in South Lyon, Michigan, one of the last people to still own a home in South Lyon, Michigan. Um, he works in his basement for a company which is bankrolled in Sacramento, California, has its technical division in Melbourne, Australia, and sells its products in Tokyo, Japan. Two or three times a year, he gets on an airplane and makes a disgustingly long flight to the other side of the ocean. The rest of the time, he works virtually. I mean, geography just, just doesn't count anymore. The idea that, you know, that the jobs that you're going to have are, gonna, are just going to be kind of the jobs that people have always had is just not true. And if you have one of those jobs, you're not going to like it because it's not a good job. It's not a job that's about the future. The future of literacy is about taking the ideas that Ferrer has and combining them with the idea of what education ought to be. At the same time that Ferrer was writing Pedagogy of the Oppressed, where the banking concept of education comes from, uh, another guy, Ivan Illich, was writing Deschooling Society. Came out the same year, 1972. And what, what Illich said, was that school has now become a place of information deficit and not information surplus. And that has been nothing but more and more true ever since 1972. It used to be that you came to school because that's where the books were. It used to be that you came to school because that's where the teachers were. That's where the information was. That's where the library was located. But now, when you come to school, there's less information in school than there is in the external world. Now, now all, not all the information in the external world is worth knowing. But there's more, you know, there are over 10 billion pages of scientific material published every year. If you do nothing, and I don't think there's any risk of anybody taking this challenge, but if you do nothing but read 24-7, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year for the rest of your life, if you define intelligence as the amount of information you know versus the amount of information that there is, we're all becoming progressively dumber every day of our lives. The amount of information that we have versus the amount of information that there is is going down because the information is increasing at such a rapid rate that you can't even begin to think about keeping up. So what does it mean to be educated? What does it mean to be literate in this world? And I think if you look at Ferrer and you look at Mesereau, they give us some clues about what it means to be literate, what it means to be educated. What it means is to be engaged. What it means is that you're learning what you're learning because you want to learn it, because you're going to use it to change the world that you live in. If you let somebody else change it for you, you're not going to like where you end up. If you sit back and say, eh, they'll work it out, they'll get back to me, I'm just going to go have some burgers, you know, hang out, catch a few videos, text my friends, 
when, when you come out of that stupor, the world that you're going to live in isn't going to be very comfortable. And unlike other people, other generations, your teachers and the adults around you are not going to be the one that makes these decisions. You're going to make them. You're going to make them because you're the people that are most closely associated with, most literate, most fluent in the technologies that are going to determine what the future of the world looks like. It's a responsibility that you have to yourself, and this is what Ferrer used to say all the time, to pursue literacy, to pursue education because you have because you have a responsibility to yourself, because you're in charge of where you're going to end up. And you can't depend on schools to do it for you. When you, when you sit in classrooms you know, and don't ask questions, when you just do the homework and don't ask yourself, OK, where does this lead? When you don't demand a better education than you've already gotten, all you're doing is limiting the ability that you're going to have in the future to be an agent of change in your own life. All you're doing is sitting, settling for a pattern, just like the literacy, just like the people that uh, Ferrer tried to teach literacy to back in Brazil. All you're doing is you're, you're allowing other people to shuffle the deck and tell you where, where it is that they think you belong. Literacy is about conflict. Literacy is about revolution for Ferrer. Literacy is about grabbing the moment and doing something with it that might upset a whole lot of people. But what they're going to do to you if you don't seize that moment should also be upsetting to you. If it's not already clear up to the last couple weeks, it ought to be clear to you now that the only way forward is a new way that the only way that this is going to work is for us to do something different than we've been doing. And that's not because your government's going to do it. It's not because it's in a textbook. It's not even because some beautifully written academic article that you find suggests it. It's because you, in combination with other people, demand it. That you imagine it. That you bring it forward. That you work for it. That you suffer for it. That's the way that change takes place. That's what Ferrer meant by literacy. He didn't mean, oh, well, uh, if we get in a group and talk about our paper, we're not just paying attention to what the instructor said. He didn't mean, well, if you don't have a multiple choice test, uh, he wasn't a big fan of those, but you know, then it's OK. He certainly didn't mean what you often get in high school, which is if you like your teacher and they come in and tell you a bunch of you know, bullshit stories every day about what's going on in their life, instead of teaching you what you need to learn, that's a cool class. Because we never did any work. You know, the fact is, is that the only way forward requires a lot of work. And it requires work and emotional commitment at a level that you have not been asked to produce so far in your life. The only way that your future looks good is if you grab it and if you do something with it. And if you understand your literacy and your education as the basis for making those changes, of, of demanding what it is that you need to know about your world, both the technologies that you need to, to learn and the, you know, the things that you need to learn about. That's what the future of literacy is. The only alternative future for literacy is that it becomes more and more oppressive. That it becomes more and more of a burden. It becomes debtor and debtor and debtor. Although, having spent some time you know, in a high school classroom, I can't imagine that it could become debtor. You, know, you, you all are, if you're not asleep, you're on drugs that you should need a physician's permission to be able to use. You know, school can't be If school's dead, it means that school and life no longer come together. If school isn't a place where ideas are sparked and conversations take place and, and that your agency develops, then school's a place where your spirit goes to die. And for, for a lot of us, you know, I mean, I've spent my whole life in education. That's not what I want school to be. I don't show up every day so that a whole bunch of people can sleep through what I'm trying to do. 
But you, you, have to, you have to make that happen. Your teachers aren't going to make it happen. They can't make it happen. It's not their world. It's yours. Thank you. As Lucia says, I will take questions if you have any. Okay, Sean. If you look at what's going on in high schools, unfortunately, I think the answer is no. I think we're getting more and more entrenched in old literacies and less and less flexible about learning new literacies. You know, we, we have taken some of the worst reform movements in American history, like back to basics, and shoved them into NCLB, and we've developed an idea about literacy in our schools that really doesn't have a future. It doesn't really have an out, you know, it doesn't have an alternative game. Uh, that people can play in order to get to where you say, say that you want to go. Now, there are going to, uh, there are now and have always been and will continue to be individual teachers who do things, but the school system right now is, is, is totally gridlocked with the ACT meet testing, NCLB, annual yearly progress, all of that kind of stuff. They're totally gridlocked. They know, they, they know that they're failing. And mathematically, if you look at NCLB, the statistical um, inevitability of NCLB is about four or five years out from now, all schools will fail. Because you can't continue to make progress every year. What happens when you get to 100%? You know, there are a lot of schools right now that are operating between 89 and 95% proficiency. But they have to make a percentage progress next year. You know, do you, have you ever been in a classroom where 100% of the people could do something? Is that, you know? So they're all, they're all going to fail, and they're locked into it. And because they fail, they're responding to the system instead of responding to the future. So I don't see it happening, you know, except in isolated incidents. And one of the things that's happening, it's already happened in high schools. It's going to start happening in college. It hasn't yet, a little bit but it's going to start happening a lot in college, is that there's going to be less and less freedom for teachers to do what Ferrer said was the, the main point of teaching, which is to engage their students and listen to what they want to learn and to help them learn it. You know, I mean, to Ferrer, that's, the, that's the, the role of the teacher. I know things you don't know. I can do things you can't do. But I can't tell you how to apply what I know to your life in a way that's going to make it meaningful. So I, I'm unfortunately, yeah, go ahead. I, I, do, you, do you think that um, this is going to have a larger and larger impact on the way we elect presidents and, and things of that nature in the future because of this lack of, of literacy um, compared to maybe 30 years ago? Yeah. I think that, I mean, how many of you, you know, if you, if you look at the things that are just going on in the financial markets right now, how many of you understand that? You know, even the people who are supposed to understand it don't understand it, so don't, you know, don't feel bad about it. I mean, they're looking at it going, what the hell is this? Um, what do we do now? Uh, the issues are going to be more complex. The world is going to be more and more complex. And yet, what education is producing is a more and more simplified, more and more compliant, more and more reduced idea of what education is. I mean, one of the things that Education in America was arguably meant to do in the beginning, John Dewey argued for this when Harry Truman started the community college movement in 1947 uh, after World War II, which is really when the, the community college boom began. He called community colleges laboratories of democracy. You know, what, who educates you to be a voter? Who educates you to take, I mean, you know, the most detested and dumb class, lame class in high school is civics or government in your senior year, right? I mean, nobody wants to take government. Nobody cares. I had a student one time, you know, we have a bicameral 
which means there's two houses, legislator, legislature, and I had a student one time in class say, well, I think it's really good that we have a bicarmel um, legislative structure. I like caramel, but, um, you know, we don't, we don't care, it's boring. You know, it's like, like if you went to high school, or even if you come here to mid, and you came in today, and you walked up to your classmates and you said, did you see the debate last night? This is the most significant election. Get away from me. <laughs> you know, I think you need to go sit in the geek corner for a while. So I, you know, I, I, think it's, I think it's going like this. School's going this way, life is going this way, and something radical has to happen to bring them back together. Jerry, I have, I have a question. Um, I'm thinking about that, uh, the analogy of the Olympics. And it sounds like one of the things that uh, you think we need to, to prepare for is, to, is uh, to be more agile and flexible. And schools, of course, are not very agile and flexible. In other words, they, they have all these courses, and this is what they are. They, there isn't much change in what the courses are, or the, that kind of thing. Um, and I mean, I don't know how to use a digital camera, or I don't know how to make a web page. I don't know. I mean, I keep trying to learn new technology, and, and I learn a lot from students. They teach me stuff all the time. Um, but it's like, it's, it's, we teachers, I think, get sort of stuck in sharing older literacies, but we're not very flexible. Um, and so how can, we, how can we get schools and teachers, for sure, to be more agile? Well, I think the key to that is to teach teachers to do just what you said you do. You know, a lot of people refer to the literacies that we teach you as legacy literacies. You know, the, the literacies of, and they're not unimportant. You know, I'm not arguing that you don't need how to know how to read, you don't need to know how to write, you don't need to know how to do the things that you're being taught to do. That, that's not my point at all. You need to do, do those, and then you need to do more. But how does the teacher position herself in the classroom? You know, do you position yourself as, okay, I walk, I mean, and I don't think, if you've never taught, you don't know the fear of walking into a room and having 25, 30, 35 people sit there all looking at you and saying to you, you know, I've, I've been around the block a few times, what do you got? Because I'm prepared to be bored. You know? I'm prepared to give you a hard time. So what do, what do you do when you're in that teacher's spot? You, you organize your stuff, you make all these little plans, and you just go through what you, what you have. Because the last thing you want to do is to hear what those people out there are thinking. Because it's not pretty. You know? So you, you practice this technology that prevents you from learning from your students. You know, you know things that we don't know. We know things you don't know. Um, how do we put those things together to create a we, to create an us? You know, how, how do we put them together so that we don't live in these little isolated silos of gener not even generations anymore, but sub-generations of people who really don't have much interest in one another? Much political contact with one another. So I think that the, the, the basic answer to your question is what kind of idea does the teacher walk in the room with? That was Woodrow's line. Yeah, that, okay. <laughs> whatever, you know, like, if we're going to say, we're gonna, this is what we need to do, we see we need to do it, and this is how we're going to do it, nevertheless what the state tells us to do, then what do you do with the people who fail? Well, what is failing? I mean, that's one of the things we can go back and look at. What does it mean to fail? I mean, if, if I say to you, you failed. In, in this context, what am I saying to you? Pardon? You didn't meet my 
Okay, and what's the reason, what's, what's the consequence of not meeting my, the state's expectations? You know, if you took a map of Michigan, and on one, and two maps of Michigan, and on one, you colored in all the dots and all the school districts based on the socioeconomic level of the people who lived in those school districts. In other words, where the rich people, where, the, where, you know, where those kids lived. Um, and then you took another map of Michigan that had the highest MEEP ACT scores and put them over each other, they'd be exactly the same. What we're doing now is sorting people based on their social economic status and, their, and, and basically the educational level of your mother. You, we're not sorting you based on what you know or what you don't know, what you can add and what you don't add. We're using school as a sorting device to say to a whole lot of people, look, this is where it stops for you. That's what fail, failure means. You know, in a different, where if you bring those things together, you know, why is it necessary for me to say that you fail? This is something I'm good at. This is something you're good at. Let's be good at our, what we do together. You know, in Europe, many of you know that at 12 or 13, you take a basic test and they split, they split the students. And some students go into vocational areas and, and, and then a smaller group of students go on to college. And Americans look at it like that and go, oh, oh my God. Here's what they don't tell you about that system. What they don't tell you about that system is that no matter which one of those layers you go into, your wages and your status in, in the community are fairly close together. They're not exactly the same, but it's not like this, like it is in America. You know, I mean, you don't lose your status as a human being because you're a trained, a skilled craftsman. You don't lose your status and you don't get to be, I'm living in this gated community where I never see any of the people that come to my practice every day if you're a doctor or a dentist, you know, a CEO or somebody like that. Um, the late David Halberstam wrote a book called The 50s. And what he talked about in the, you know, the major thing he said about the 50s wasn't about hula hoops and poodle skirts and stuff like that. He said that in the 50s in America, people lived in towns. And everybody in the town went to the same school. And everybody in the town shopped at the same grocery store. And they knew each other. But today, Americans live in segregated little communities, pockets, even in the same city where they never really interact each other, with each other. My kids go to this school. You have to go to the public school. And for the last 25 years since the Nation of Risk in 1983, the right in this country has been on a dogged pursuit of the diminishing, both in terms of funding and in terms of you know, using evidence to falsely show how bad schools are, of destroying public education in this country. If you live in the East, like my brother does, the last thing you do is go to a public school, particularly for a university. You spend $35,000 a year to go to a third-rate liberal arts school instead of going to a good public, a public institution. So failure is about, failure is a social, it's not an academic, you know, it's not an academic language, it's a social language. It's a language of social value and social sorting. So what you do with those people is you find out what they can do and you have them contribute what they can do. Instead of using school as a way of saying some people have a better economic future than the others. And that's what we're doing right now. And, the, and that decision is being based on the future that you already have. It's being based on who your parents are. I'm sure a couple of my students yeah. have questions. Um, we have one back there. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Are we going to have the, the fuel and the, and the want to change? The want to reach for what we want to make change? 
That's the $64,000 question, isn't it? You know, I mean, social scientists will tell you that it takes something like this for radical social change to really take place. That people don't make, by and large, radical social changes when things are okay. You know, um, Roosevelt never would have passed the New Deal without the Depression, right? I mean, so, I, what you say is, I think, true, but it's not guaranteed. You know, I mean, it's, it's equally possible that you'll all sit on the sidelines and not make that change. It's equally possible that, I mean, there's one of two kinds of changes. Either, either things become more collaborative, more democratic, more economically viable, or they become more oppressive. And that's an equal possibility. You know, ask the people who lived in Eastern Europe under Soviet rule for all that. That's the other alternative. You know, it doesn't have to go the good way just because we're a democracy. Well, so much different than each other. We can't grasp all the same concepts. I, I, I would say two things to that. One is, I don't think we're that different. You know, I think that what, one of the things we've done is we've taken marginal social differences and blown them way out of proportion. You know, so, oh, I can't understand you. You're six months and two days older than me, so you're in a different generation and we don't have anything to talk about anymore. Okay? Um, I think what has happened, the second part of that is, that it is, in, it, it is in certain people who are in power, it is in their interest for you to think exactly the way that you think. It's in their interest for us to be fragmented because if we ever got together, if we ever found a political voice, think of how things would be different. If, if students in a high school walked out, stood on the sidewalk and said, we're not going back in until there's some changes made here. And if half the teachers walked out with them, what would happen? In Japan, when they tried to do what we call the meet to elementary schools, you know what Japanese teachers did? They said, no way. They said, we're not going to do it. Oh, no, you got to do it. We're not doing it. One of the things that the right-wing attack on schools has done is it's undermined the credibility of teachers so that we see teachers as bad people. And because of that, they don't have the, the critical viability, the political viability to stand up and say enough is enough. Difference is something that you're all going to live with for the rest of your lives. You're going to meet more and more different kinds of people than, than your parents did and you're going to have to find a way to talk to them. School should be a place that makes that happen, not prevents it from happening. We don't even let classes by social class, middle class, upper class, lower class, working class people mingle very much in high schools. We segregate you. And now we've done it, we did it so well that now you'll self-segregate yourselves. You'll, you'll pick your own spot and you'll go there and you'll stay there and that, that's it. Anything else? Yes. Well, I think that I think it's okay to have standards that you ask people to reach because legitimately those standards exist out there. If you can't do certain kinds of things, then you're, you know, I don't think, but, but the way that you get there has to be more individual. You know, we used to think that people were pretty much developed by the time they were 16. Now the research is that you're in your mid to late 20s before your brain is even fully developed. Okay, so there's still hope for some of you guys. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, now, so we don't get there. Look at, you know, if, if you've ever watched babies grow up, there are no two babies that do the same thing at the same time, the same way, and the same day. You buy baby books, you read it, and it says, uh, six months, your baby should be doing cartwheels across the living room. And you look at your baby, <laughs> and you say, oh, God, I have a, you know, my child is an undone scat. So, you know, I mean, you need both. You need an individual way to get 
to what the standards are. And to go back to his question, you know, those standards, there have to be things that the people who, you know, not everybody needs to be a nuclear physicist. There have to be productive and respected things for the rest of the people in the culture to do. So, okay, it's about time. Thanks very much for coming. Um, good luck with your semester, and I'll see you around.